Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of the Ask Bill Keegan Show. Today um, we want to talk about an issue that's been on, on the minds of, of citizens across the, across the country at the national, uh, state and local level and that's the, the topic of uh, opioid addiction and drug abuse. Folks have been, uh, have been, have been expressing concerns about this topic for, for quite some time now and of course the issue of opioid addiction has become a very serious matter for all of us to deal with, even here in Foxborough. Today I want to welcome the Foxborough Chief of Police, Ed O'Leary, uh, Foxborough Fire Chief, Roger Hatfield, and Foxborough uh, Council on Aging and Human Services Director, Vicki Lowe. Thank you for all being, for being here today to talk about this very important issue. Chief, um, I'm going to start off with you this morning because I think um, what, what we know about the opioid addiction issue is that it's, it's far-reaching. Uh, we know that it's, it's one that, that, can, that can affect any family at any time. Um, and it, and it, it happens with some of the most innocent situations that have occurred um, here, even in this own community. So I'd like to ask you, just from your perspective, what, do you see, what have you seen in Foxborough? What have you seen in this region? And, what, and what, are we, what steps are we starting to take in this area? Well, in terms of our community, uh, we've had numerous responses uh, with <coughs> fire service and my staff involved and people that are exhibiting signs of being in an overdose condition. Mm -hmm. And as a result of that, uh, very often it's determined it, it's either been caused by uh, the use of heroin uh, mixed with fentanyl in some cases and even uh, pill misuse. Uh, this isn't just a Foxborough problem though, Bill. It's mm -hmm. a statewide problem. Mm -hmm. In fact, 75% of our communities here in the Commonwealth have had at least one overdose death. So it's no longer an urban issue. It's affecting every community. Mm -hmm. uh, everyone seems to believe a, a direct causation is the misuse of pain pills that have been uh, given by doctors and uh, issued scripts through pharmacies to get pain pills that people then become addicted to and either continue to obtain pain pills because they have insurance plans that help fund it uh, and they become enmeshed in uh, a constant drug use to keep from feeling the pain or the anxiety from going off pain pills. If those people don't have insurance and they are switching to heroin, uh, which has a much greater risk for the users involved. So it's something that's happening across the communities. And I know, you know we've started our own uh, reactivation of Safe Foxborough, uh, a collective event for all of us to work together, including the schools, uh, right. to try and get prevention programs more in the mainstream. Well, thank you for, for sort of highlighting those points because we have, um, in, the, in the past uh, few months, We've initiated this new task force that is um, ident identified just for the purpose of looking at this issue on a, on a broader scale. But I think um, we're looking at some, some regional solutions as well. We'll get into that in just a few minutes with Vicki on this discussion. But um, I just want to talk a little bit about some of the things we're doing on the treatment side and, and how we've been re responding to some of the, the, the more serious cases. Mm -hmm. And Chief Hatfield, maybe you can speak to some of those points. Mm, absolutely, Bill. Th first of all, thanks for mm -hmm. allowing us to be part of this discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, as uh, Chief O'Leary's brought up, uh, you know, we as a community have been working uh, hand in hand in dealing with this type of crisis uh, for quite some time. When Foxborough became uh, an ambulance service that started doing advanced life support, and that was in 2000, we started carrying Narcan. Mm -hmm. uh, Narcan, as most people now that have been following the opioid crisis understands, that that is a life-saving drug that we can use to kind of um, bring a person that is overdosed back so that we can, you know, try to save their lives. Um, and, and the paramedics have been using it but it has been now an increase in use. Mm -hmm. And uh, just to give some statistical data, in Foxborough, and I got these numbers from Lieutenant Grenier, that is our EMS coordinator, uh, in 2010 we had 10 overdoses. Uh, I take that back, 2014 we had 10 overdoses. 2015 we had 16 overdoses. Mm -hmm. um, and already this year we've uh, had used Narcan 11 times. Wow. Um, so uh, it is an increasing situation that we're dealing with here in our small little community. And as, as Ed brought up, it's something that we're dealing with as a state. And last year when, when I, uh, all the fire chiefs met in D.C., 
Uh, this is a national academic, uh, academic and, and, and they're all talking about it. The whole mm -hmm. conference was how are we as a country going to deal with this? How are we going to deal with the <coughs> pharmaceutical companies? How are we going to try to help with, with preventive programs, mm -hmm. pain management? And uh, truly, I think the biggest discussion that we've been having in your meetings, Bill, is what are we going to do about it for those that are, are addicted? How can we help them in the post aspect? and help those families. Um, but it is uh, something that is uh, very, very near and dear to our community and it uh, is something that I, I think uh, we are trying to take a proactive stance on that. Great, thank you. Um, I know that the, um, we've, we've gotten to the point where we, I think we understand a little bit more about what causes this to happen and some of it maybe is, is um, as intricate as, as the genetic uh, dysfunction in some cases where some people become addicted because just by merely being um, uh, uh, taking the opioid uh, drugs just to, on a very innocent type basis. Uh, for instance, <coughs> I, there are a number of cases where we have um, uh, student athletes who get injured while they're, uh, while they're playing their sports and then uh, sustain an injury, uh, go, go in for surgery or for, or for some kind of a, a, a corrective measure to, uh, to, to correct their injury. And then they get put on some sort of a, an opioid type uh, painkiller type uh, program, and um, and before you know it, they they become addicted to that, uh, not realizing you know that they, they had some sort of a an effect that, that kind of had that kind of effect on them initially. So I think what we what we're trying to do at this level now, and this is a, something we've discussed at the task force level, um, is to, is to try and look, focus on education. And um, I thought the, the chief did a, uh, made a very good point the other day that we really need to do a better job of educating the public on this particular topic and, and sort of setting, and letting people know what the warning signs are and how, what's proactive measures we can take. And so Vicki, I'm going to turn to you at this point and, 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 and let you speak a little bit about some of the things that you've seen and how you know, there's other ways to deal with, with pain management mm -hmm. that, uh, in some of the programs that you're looking at right now. All right. Um, well, this, this really is a multi-layered issue. Um, in the past, probably about four years ago, we had the DA's office come in, or maybe it was three years ago, had the DA's office come in mm -hmm. to educate seniors on how to safely um, dispose of their medications that mm -hmm. they're no longer using, we, how to you know, store them so that they, thinking of their grandchildren, didn't, we, we try to protect their children and grandchildren from right. taking their medications. Right. Um, now, with the baby boomer um, population explosion, um, statistically, emergency rooms are seeing you know double, sometimes triple the times it, number of overdoses for people who are seniors. Mm -hmm. So now we're kind of focusing more on the senior population as being people who um, have the substance use problem. Um, many of our human service clients that are in need of social service assistance um, the, the core to some of those problems is substance use. Mm -hmm. And so our social worker has to be very, um, you know, good at making, giving, having resources and giving referrals to people who are in the throes of it. Right. Um, but right now, um, I've been working with Cindy Peterson at Brigham and Women's Health Center in Foxborough mm -hmm. to put together a program that would be a panel discussion where we are looking at, um, you know, what how the um, physicians are prescribing medications and educa educating patients and their families about opioid prescriptions. And um, so we've, we've talked about it. We're going to be having a conference call at the end of the month to set up the panel program. Mm -hmm. um, but I've just today, when before I came here, I had e an email from Cindy Peterson saying that Norwood and Sharon have also reached out to her to see if they could be part of our um, conversation about getting this education program going. That's great. Um, so it is something that, you know, maybe we'll have more of a regional approach if these other towns are interested. Mm -hmm. um, currently, I have a program going on um, for chronic pain self-management. It's an evidence-based program. It's supported by a grant from HESCO Elder Services, and it shows people um, different ways to manage their pain um, that isn't with more medication. Um, it's for people with chronic pain. So mm -hmm. that's ongoing right now, too, to try to help seniors. And we've had a really good response to people wanting to be in that program. It's at, at 
full capacity. Great, that's great. So, um, so there are those are just some of the proactive measures that we're taking at this yes. time. And also <coughs> noted too that the the governor signed a uh, sweeping opioid abuse law that was uh, headlined in the in this month's version of the Beacon, uh, that was passed unanimously by both houses, the Senate and, and the uh, and the House, and um, which in 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 many parts of the bill have actually. Uh, put Massachusetts in the forefront of this issue on a national level. So we are sort of leading the way in, in, many, in many ways on the, on the statewide level. I think a lot of communities are trying to, to find their way through this issue on, on, a, um, on a local level. Uh, one thing that we're trying really hard to do, though, is not continuously repeat the same things that are being done in other towns. So it, to the extent that we can, um, we can, we can provide information that, that makes sense on a regional basis and really make an impact, um, you know, I think that really is going to be a much more effective way of dealing with this, this, this type of situation. Chief. Well, I, I think that um, the big things that we have to look at, and I commend Vicki and how they're working towards some preventive measures and preventive training for the seniors. I also want to commend Chief O'Leary and Superintendent Deb Spinelli mm -hmm. that have also been doing it on the youth side right. uh, when looking at the junior high and the high school level in mm -hmm. Foxborough Safe. Uh, they started looking at this with a proactive stance of, uh, of positive uh, educational opportunities to try to keep our youth out of it. The piece that we're missing, though, is that, that t mid middle 20s, middle 30-year-old right. group. And right. that's where I think our committee that you've established, mm -hmm. we're going to try to focus our energy, is how do we mm -hmm. get that preventive training out there right. for those mid-20s, mid-30-year-old um, members of our community? Right. I think, I think that's absolutely true. There, there is a... Uh, a pretty active educational program going on in the school at the school level, and and even at the at the elderly level, it's it's being uh, talked about quite a bit. It's the gap in between mm -hmm. that we're not being able to reach, and I think that's what we want to try and do on a proactive measure, uh, proactive level rather. So I think um, one that was the thing that we talked about at the at the task force recently on April fifth, that um, we think our biggest focus should be on education. Um, there's lots of different programs emerging now uh, on the treatment side, um, but there's still a lot to do. There's still a lot more, more places to go, but I think we just, on the, on the local level, I think we need to do a better job of just getting the word out and educating the folks that, yes, it is possible to occur here, even, at, even in Foxborough, which, you know, most people believe this to be a very safe and, and, and healthy environment. It is. I mean, I think, but unfortunately, uh, this has sort of crept into um, the community as it has across the Commonwealth and across the country. So we, we have to be aware of it, we have to be uh, ready to deal with it, and we have to just make sure that we're, we're educating everyone on, on all levels that uh, there are consequences to, to what happens when you, when, you, when you take some of these, these, these so-called so innocent uh, pain-killing type, of, type of, um, uh, of medications. So, Vicki, you were going to say? Well, I did want to just say, mm -hmm. um, even though the three of us are here, I mean, yes. I do commend you for bringing all of the department heads together and for mm -hmm. keeping us all um, as a community working together. And Pauline right. Clifford, the health Absolutely. agent, yes. is doing the um, drug take back day yep. where there can be sharps and other things that are not mm -hmm. able right. to be put into the kiosk. Right. I don't know if you want to talk more about your kiosk, mm -hmm. but I think as a, as a you know, your management in the community has helped us all pull together mm -hmm. um, to really have a really tight exactly. well, mission well, on trying to help things in the community. Well, well thank you. And I just, I just, I want to talk about some of the, the folks that we pulled together. Um, for instance, we've, we've had uh, the fire department, of course, and Mike, Mike Kelleher is, is assistant on that level as well. Um, we've brought, we brought in uh, Rich Noonan as well from the, from the police department, from the, as a lieutenant of the police department. Uh, Chris Long, who's a, uh, obviously a very concerned parent, uh, who's, uh, who's been very, uh, become active in the group as well. Uh, Vicki, of course, and, and Gail Peral from NORCAP uh, has become involved, and in, uh, perhaps you can talk a little bit more about yeah, NORCAP in, in just a second. Uh, Sheila Wallace from the, uh, from the Stewart Health uh, Healthcare Program, uh, and Pauline Clifford, and of course, Mike Johns from the Veterans. Um, that's the group that we've pulled together for now. Also, and, and of course, uh, Deb Spinelli and and, and the folks at the school department as well have been very actively involved. So um, we're going to continue to keep that group going. We're meeting again uh, next, the beginning of next month to, uh, to further the discussion on, on steps we can take. We want to hold a forum at some point. Um, and, and, Chief, and Chief, perhaps you can talk a little bit about you know, some of the things that we, we plan to do for that. Well, at the, the forum, we could bring <clears throat> together a group of 
uh, <clears throat> people that are actively involved in one phase or another, whether treatment, uh, recovery issues, mm -hmm. uh, just to make people more aware of what's mm -hmm. going on mm -hmm. in the community and hopefully get more people to become uh, better educated as part of a, a prevention theme that you know, we should be focused on, mm -hmm. uh, as well as you know certainly uh, intervention and recovery as secondary goals. Mm -hmm. uh, I've already lined up to bring in somebody for the May 3rd meeting from Stoughton, uh, where they've created a follow-up program when people are receiving treatment of Narcan uh, to go back and try and assist them into a recovery mode and find a treatment place for them so they can get help. Uh, because national studies have shown that if there is some type of follow-up to a medical emergency, very often that's the catalyst for that individual to at least initiate some type of treatment and recovery process. Right. Uh, and that, that's a goal. Certainly the schools and uh, the assistance from the district attorney's office. Uh, last week, uh, shortly after we had our group meeting, I had Jen Rowe go in and talk to the high school staff uh, during a staff development meeting at the end of school. And uh, she laid out uh, very similar information that she presented to the depar town department heads a few months ago. Uh, only the, the sad news is, is that we've had over 150 deaths here in our county, far outweighing the number of people killed in motor vehicle crashes. Mm -hmm. And 80% uh, of those deaths as a result of uh, autopsy investigations uh, indicate that it's not just heroin, it's overdosing by different types of medications. And I think that's a scarier thing because people probably can rationalize, oh, I'm not that bad, I'm not using heroin. Right. But the risk is essentially mm -hmm. there. And it's, uh, and she brought up something at the teacher staff meeting, for every death we have uh, nationally, we're having 10 admissions to a hospital, we're having 35 visits uh, to ERs, and last year alone, over 60,000 young children had to be treated at ER rooms for medication overdose due to not properly securing medications in the home. Mm -hmm. Just to reinforce that idea uh, that just having an open medicine cabinet with a wide variety of pills that might have been useful three years ago if you were having you know, major surgery, but really have no place in keeping it in the household. Right. Well, I think that's, um, we're gonna, we're gonna see some incubated, new incubator industries emerge because finding ways to secure medicines at home so that, so that people just, uh, only those people that really should be using those medicines are using right. them properly. Um, but again, the, probably the best remedy for that is to just to not have it in the house unless you're using it. And so um, you, we still have, like you say, the, 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 the uh, disposal unit at the, um, at the police station, at the public safety bu building that we can, that folks can drop by any time and drop that off and then the drug, drug take back day on April 30th, which is really important. Mm. Um, I think that those are things, those are proactive measures again that we need to take in order to, to offset some of the impacts of what's been going on. So, so tell me, uh, Chief, what, what, tell, tell us a little about what, what's going on with NORCAP and what, what they do for the community. Yeah, I think that, um, as you're seeing, I think that we as a community, it's a three-phase process. You've got mm -hmm. the preventive of action, uh, the preventive type things that we're doing with education and trying to make sure people are aware. Then you have actually the response, and that's where, you know, the police department and the fire department carrying uh, Narcan and responding to those type of crises to try to save a life is, is critically important. Then you really have then the posts, the treatment and the uh, helping and assisting that individual with their, their drug addiction, but, but really also supporting the families. And that's where NORCAP, law, uh, NORCAP uh, Treatment Center becomes a real big uh, asset to us. It's here in our community. I'm, I'm excited that they're part of our task force. And um, they're going to be able to assist us as a community in dealing with the treatment, with that post-event of making sure that we're giving any of our residents the ability to get themselves clean and get them treated from the use of any type of opioid. And then, uh, you know, the other thing that we still need to continue to work is, is how do we support those families? 
those that are, that are dealing with a loved one that has this addiction. And I think, uh, you know, that's where, you know, NORCAP Lodge and, and those type of uh, services are going to be needed. And it, it could also be uh, spiritual too, you know, getting our priests uh, and our, our churches involved that can help support families. Uh, I know we've discussed that at, the, at our meetings, and um, it's, it's a three-phase process. And I think that we're doing really, really good on two of them, and we're working in identifying that third part, and I think that that's where um, NORCAP can help us a lot. Great. I know, I know on the, also again, on the state level, um, the Mass Municipal Association has, uh, has made this a, a priority issue for the upcoming year. Uh, in fact, they, they sent out a... Uh, a, a document called an obligation to lead, uh, which is uh, put together by the Mass Municipal Association, and it's, it's it was a document which talks primarily about the about the uh, work that the uh, that the statewide uh, MMA uh, special task force on municipal opioid addiction and overdose prevention task force was created to do, um, which is getting made up of representatives from across the Commonwealth. Um, one, th one thing that they, they point out directly, and the reason why it is such an important issue, is that in the past three years, at least 258 of the Commonwealth's 351 cities and towns, or nearly 75%, have lost residents to a fatal opioid overdose. overdose. So that's, that's clearly a very significant statistic, uh, far-reaching in many ways, because uh, we deal with so many other aspects of, of accidental deaths in, in our communities, but this one seems to be uh, happening on a much more frequent basis than than ones that we've seen in the past. Vicki, what, what do you think, um, what are, th what are the, the, um, the, the other things that perhaps you, you've seen happening on, on your level at the, uh, at, the, at, the, on, at the Council on Aging and the, and the youth and the, and the, uh, and the health, health services? So what, are you, what are you seeing? Well, yeah, um, I mentioned the baby boomers before, and mm -hmm. um, the generation of baby boomers have a whole different mindset about drug use. They were probably the first generation that started recreational drug use, as far as I know. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, and right. now they're all becoming seniors. And um, so it is a much bigger issue for us. And um, Pam, the community social worker, and I have been um, signing up for every substance use uh, class that right. we can take and um, you know trying to really educate ourselves and really tighten up our resources to be able to give that to people that we're seeing that are either families like like the chief mentioned you know that about Al-Anon and some of the other programs that are out there for people who are doing taking narcotics for their families to get support as well as for the the person themselves so um, that's that's kind of our mission. We're trying to really tighten up all of all of those resources. One one of the things that we we thank you for that. I think that I think what we're uh, finding is that um, there seems to be this. Uh, it's it's one of these um, you know don't tell type of stories where people are almost embarrassed by the situation, so they don't want to talk about it. Uh, but yet, the more we talk about it, the more we're able to get to get to a so solution about it. So I think. I think we, the purpose of our group primarily is to let people know that there is a, a, a channel for which they can, we can help, help them and we can provide more information to them. So um, we're, we're going to finish this show today by making sure that everybody's aware that they can contact the town hall, contact your office, contact mm -hmm. fire or police, and if they need help in this area, you know, it's completely, we can keep it completely anonymous, there's not an issue that way. Just to provide them with assistance. I mean, I don't, there's a lot of different levels of assistance. There's, there's certain, there's, there's family assistance, there is counseling on, on, on all levels that need to be considered here. Um, obviously, the more we can educate the youngsters to, to stay away from it, um, or, or the, or, and the parents to understand when they take their, their kids for, to, to see doctors, that they can somewhat limit the, the, the exposure to opioids uh, with, or at some restricted level. I think that's what the new legislation describes, is that there's a limitation of, of what, seven days uh, of, of prescribed, prescribed opioid uh, medications now. So uh, that's a certainly a step in the right direction. Uh, I'm sure there'll be other amendments to that law as, as, as it goes forward, because they'll be, um, they, once they put it into use, they'll find other changes that need to be made. One other thing that I just mm -hmm. wanted to mention is um, <clears throat> there's also the level of education for the providers, for the doctors, mm -hmm. for the nurse practitioners. Um, you know, when there's an, a senior that is going to 
-hmm. the emergency room because they've fallen several times or had um, accidents and they just kind of chalk it up to the person who's getting older instead of having a conversation with the person about whether they're drinking or taking any kind of, of drugs or or how they're taking their medications you know do they have a pill box are they managing them well do they need visiting nurses to come in some of those issues um, I think sometimes physicians feel like you know they they're being polite and it's like this little old lady there or no, man right. that yeah. they you know and and they don't want to um, insult them when really it's it's sometimes it's that's what the issue is when yeah. there are all of these frequent falls and you know it's, you don't right. just fall because you get older you right. fall for a reason so exactly. so um, I think that's why it's really great that we're including Brigham and Women's and, right. and Norwood right. uh, Stewart and they're um, great partners NORCAP yeah. to have they really are partners. great partners so yeah. And, and, they, and what's what's most important is that they've actually seen the real, um, real real scenarios evolve before them, and so they they can deal with these situations before and let us know what to expect when certain situations evolve. Now, I think again, we, we want to leave the treatment and the and the and the real professional responsibilities to those who who've been trained properly to do those mm -hmm. those type of, of responses. But in terms of what our role is, is to educate, provide resources to the community and to, and to let people know that we're here to support those situations as they evolve. Now, we don't, we, we, we just hearing from some of the, the folks on the committee, I mean, Chris Long has, has, has provided us with some really great information, mm. um, obviously having, you know, on a very personal level, of how she's described her situation to all of us, and we've, we've all learned a lot from her already just in the short time that we've been working with her. So. Um, we're going to learn more about this as we as we go forward because there's a lot lot to learn uh, on, on all levels. So, I want to thank you all for being here today. Um, I know it's a very difficult topic to to, to work on, and, and I, I appreciate all your help. There's a lot of, as you said, um, collectively there was uh, there's a lot of folks working on this. This is not something we can do by ourselves. We need help on this, and we're going to try and get more help on a regional level too, to to, uh, to see uh, what we can do. And, and there's also going to be um, based on the new bill that's been signed by the governor, um, there's going to be some financial resources available to us. Uh, I know there's been some talk about us doing some, some local funding of this, but there's going to be enough funding resources made at the state level and regional basis that I think we'll be, we'll be fine to do that. I think providing funding on a single, on a single source basis for these types of pro issues um, may not be as effective as, as if we do it on, on a more regional basis to get more recent resources to bring to bring to the bring to the table on that. So, I think that's that's the approach that we'd like to uh, continue to pursue at this time. So, thank you all for being here today. Oh, today, thank I, you for having I'll, us. I, I'd like to just uh, while well, well, I've got a few minutes just to talk about um, some of the other things we've been working on. First of all, um, great news that we've been able to break ground in the new town hall. Um, the, the construction of that is going to be taking place over the next several months. Uh, the construction schedule is about 14 to 16 months. So um, in case anyone tries to drive to Town Hall, you notice that there are barriers up around the area that's going to be under construction. And the fences are going up today as we speak. So um, you'll be starting to see some real activity over the next few weeks. Um, we, we do uh, request and, and appreciate your, your indulgence as the construction goes on and, and ask that, that folks pretty much stay away from the construction area during, during the activity. It's, it's going to be a hot, hot area. So we request that you stay away from it, and uh, uh, so that we don't, uh, of course, see any injuries there. But um, but the, the we're very excited that the project is is well underway, and uh, will be um, take about 14 to 16 months before we see the final product. Second thing I wanted to just point out is that we do have a, a, a an annual town meeting coming up on May 9th. Uh, that'll be at the high school starting at seven o'clock, and so we we do welcome everyone to join us that night that evening. And uh, we have about 30, 31, 32 articles to, to cover that, that night, including the annual operating budget and capital plan. So we certainly welcome you to attend on that evening. And, and the good news is that um, uh, our, our ad advisory committee has been working diligently along with the Board of Selectmen and all the various boards and committees, the Planning Board, uh, Conservation Commission, all the different committees are working hard to, to get their work done. And, and we look like we're on, we're on schedule to keep that, that project, to, uh, that keep that meeting um, complete and, and on time. So it's busy, busy time this time of year for all of us. Uh, I know that uh, all of you have been in the and season is starting up again at the, at the stadium. Right. So uh, the short vacation that both these two chiefs have had <laughs> uh, about, about maybe about 30 days in between seasons um, 
they're, they're back at it now with the uh, soccer season is upon us now. So, um, and then we also have uh, a lot of concerts coming up this year too. It's going to be a very Correct. busy concert very season. Very busy year. <laughs> and um, I was just uh, notified that there'll be some additional activities as, as of yesterday. It looks like lacrosse will be back next year. Excellent. So, cool. um, <laughs> so and next year and the year after that. So for the NCAA lacrosse. So that's going to be fun to see right here in, uh, at Gillette. So um, lots of good things going on in, in the community. So, so without further ado, I want to thank everyone for joining us again today. I want to thank my guests, uh, Chief, Chief O'Leary, Vicki Lowe, and Chief Hatfield for being here today. And uh, we'll look for you next time right here on the Aspel Keegan Show. Thank you.